And with that, uh, I'll say that I am the new guy at RTA. November 1st of last year was my first day. Uh, it was the day of our annual convention last year in St. Louis. Uh, to say that I was very excited uh, to be there was an understatement. I spent eight years working for Union Pacific Railroad. While that got me here, that was a very uh, tall task. Uh, as big corporations do what they do, I started out with uh, two partners uh, and ended up, before I left in the eight years that I was there, uh, they were early retired or retired outright, uh, and I was given the whole system. And so my job at Union Pacific was our forest products inventory. And so with the railroad, especially the largest railroad, uh, that was not an easy endeavor, uh, but it got me here. And so I participated with the RTA for several years as an instructor in their tie grading seminar. And that's one of our annual staple items. Uh, beyond our annual meeting that occurs in the fall, we also have a tie grading seminar, and I'll pitch that a lot harder here in a slide coming up. But just so you know, it's, it's one of our uh, educational type events, and we also hold a members-only field trip in the summer uh, that is a networking opportunity. It's a small group, usually 40 or less, and we have to cap it at 40 uh, just for arrangement's sake. We go to treating plants, we go to sawmills, we go to railroad venues. Um, we may go to a winery to learn about wine because somehow that's related to cross ties and learning about cross ties. And sometimes we go to a brewery to learn about cross ties and that, how that's related to cross ties. Uh, as more people are coming into the room, I'm, I'm going to stop just a second. Um, for those that are from the south, could you just raise your hand and people take note of who raises their hand? I'm not being preferential, absolutely not. Uh, sometimes when I get a little too far north, uh, people don't understand my accent and they don't understand some of the words I use. So look around and find your buddy. They can help translate for me as I am from Mississippi. Uh, as you can read on the slide, I've tried to give you some time here. Uh, this is my team. Uh, I've got a very tenured staff. I'm very lucky uh, to have them around. Uh, I myself have just mentioned I come from Union Pacific Railroad for eight years. Before that, I worked for Colin McCown at the American Wood Protection Association before that, or after that, but before Union Pacific, I worked for the Mississippi Forestry Association. And I actually hold adjunct professor status at Mississippi State today, and so I help teach classes, uh, do any type of cooperative extension work that those guys need. Uh, and, and trust me, uh, I'll say something really stupid throughout this presentation to bring us all back down to earth, so don't worry about that. Uh, with the staff, uh, we've got Debbie and Barbara and Kristen and Petter. Uh, as the team has grown uh, by virtue of me, by one, uh, I had the opportunity to kind of set a pretty clean slate early on. And so I adopted this for my friend uh, Phil Mickelson. He's a professional golfer. I say friend because I text him, but he doesn't text me back. But I adopted this principle from him. So he has a standing arrangement with his caddies. And so that is, you have, the, you have the power to veto one thing throughout the season. One thing. And so I gave, gave each staffer the power to veto one stupid idea that I was dead set on doing throughout the year. Luckily, nobody's had to use anything yet. They may all be saving it here for the end. But they have that power. And a little bit more about the inner workings of RTA. There's several RTA members in the room. Thank you so much for your participation and contributions. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Those that know Debbie and Barbara uh, can appreciate this. And so uh, I'm very, again, very fortunate they stayed with me. We had some volatile times at the RTA, but luckily they stayed with me. And, and anybody that, that works with tenured staff understands that level of institutional knowledge and how important that is to the day-to-day -day operations and your strategic planning moving forward. Again, each have a power of veto. Nate, that's dumb, don't do that. Or they can give me historical context. And so uh, I'm really appreciative of them. But for those that are members of RTA and then know Deb and Barb, and then are also gonna come see us in Orlando, October 2nd through the 5th at the Wyndham Grand Bonnet Creek for our annual meeting, Please understand this, and I'm, I, I cannot be more clear about this. Uh, if you directly or indirectly witness 
or hear about Barbara and or Deb overachieving in any way, I have a standing disciplinary action form waiting on them if they do. Joking, completely joking. All right, that's a lead balloon. We we'll hopefully won't have any more of those. <laughs> to give us depth of context, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of RTA because I are one, and then we'll get into some of the statistics and market scope, and then I will actually talk about tie grades because there's several Sawyers in the room that's, that's going to be compelling to you. Again, we hold events throughout the year that you can get more uh, in-depth about these different things, but uh, just a uh, for those optimizers in the room, you're cringing at my graphic. I drew that all on my own on the right. So that's a sawing solution. Uh, just put in perspective, about a 13-inch diameter log, nine-foot log. Uh, you would get a boxed heart cross tie out of that. Uh, we love it. That's our bread and butter. Uh, we've got situations going on right now that I'll talk about and support uh, with where our statistics. Excuse me. Uh, where our industry is and talk about it from a factual standpoint with statistics because uh, there's uh, room to grow when it comes to uh, manufacturing cross ties. But I am very much aware uh, this crowd is very educated in what they can and can't do within their operations. I, I know you can't whole hog jump into cross ties. You may not have the resource to be able to do that or the means to be able to do that at your facility. Uh, but at least think about it. Uh, so with that, RTA is over 100 years old. We're about to hold our 104th annual meeting, October 2nd through the 5th in Orlando, Florida at the Wyndham Grand Bonnet Creek. Uh, with that, uh, 1987 is kind of a watershed year. The reason we say that is that is the year that we started collecting the statistics and the data and information that we have today uh, that no one else within the cross style realm can compare to. So that uh, level of importance and that value that we bring to our members is very unique. Uh, <clears throat> we do uh, work off a dues basis, so we have obviously the annual dues and then we have a production based dues paradigm that uh, is arbitrary, third party, uh, encapsulated. Uh, I can talk a little bit more about that uh, over a cocktail. It's 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 the means in which we are able to operate. We've also got events, sponsorship, we've got events, contribution and participation in other ways. Uh, but day in, day out, it's the two cent per tie production-based dues scenario that keeps us afloat. And you saw on the slide, we're, we're a small shop. Uh, we do have almost 3,000 members. If you look at it from an individual standpoint, uh, obviously it would be more an aggregate looking at the number of companies. and so. Uh, anywhere from a sawmill to an end user railroad, uh, all points in between, ancillary to that as well. We're very proud of the membership that we have. Um, we work very closely with a lot of different partners, whether it's on the force product side of the thing or the transportation side of, of what we do. Uh, those alliances uh, are what helps us not only stay relevant, uh, but also be able to conduct uh, the business that we conduct in such a high quality fashion. This is more of a legislative talking point. So we partner with the Railway Supply Institute. Uh, we have these statistics available for every state. I recently gave a, a presentation like this at the Missouri Forest Products Association. I showed the Missouri slide uh, for this. It's a good talking point because it gives you uh, a quick, uh, this is how much the railroad industry is involved in our state. Uh, it's, you know, it's beyond ties, it's beyond ballast, it's beyond rail, it's beyond uh, you know, different metal things for, you know, obviously all the different fasteners, et cetera. Uh, it just gives us a talking point. And with our over 30 years of data, uh, the American Short Line and Regional, Regional Railroad Association, say that five times fast, American Short Line and Regional Railroad Association, uh, was able to take not only the RSI data that we help collaborate with and that help uh, establish, uh, we're actually able to take that and the RTA statistic and use that as a bundle to go to policymakers and actually get some implementation in terms of dollars available to them to update the short line and regional railroads. That was critical uh, and uh, the Staggers Act of 1980 also facilitated some of that mindset where, yes, they are big freight railroads, but as you all know, we've been hearing about uh, the potential labor issues with the railroads, it came to light most folks, I, I would think, uh, don't quite know that Amtrak 
runs on those same freight lines. And so uh, keeping track status is important. Uh, and there's a lot of, obviously, cogs in the wheel that facilitates that throughout the year from uh, sawmills all the way again up to that railroad end user. Uh, so with that, we were able to not only get some data, but also uh, give power to the, the information that we collect and our members have full access to. Our members contribute to this data uh, and we verify this data. I call it, I was just talking to Terry uh, a couple weeks ago uh, with Miller Publishing, this is a three-legged stool of data. And so uh, when I talk about our information and the validity of it, um, my bearing is that our producers are giving us their production information. Our end user members are giving us their purchase information. And then our allied associations and other data sources are giving the actual in track service information. And so we can triangulate those three data points and get a high degree of accuracy in terms of our data. I'm really selling it really hard. You should be a member of RTA because you have access to data like that. And we have a meeting coming up October 2nd at the Wyndham Grand, Bonnet Creek in Orlando, Florida. We use that data not only to build these models, but they're everyday tools. Uh, there's several tie buyers that are in the room or outside the room uh, that use this information. Not only do they contribute towards it, they use it as talking points with their mills. I have sawmillers call me directly. Hey, I don't agree with that dashboard. And that's what's on the right side is you've got our dashboard. Uh, or excuse me, I'm on the wrong side. You've got, uh, that's a subsequent, subsequent side, sorry. With this data that we've held since 87, 88, we can, again, model what's going on in the industry. And so I'll lead into, let's try to pay attention, uh, and I know I realize I'm talking to you before lunch, but let's try to pay attention to this ISR number. That's a, the number that's on uh, the far right of your respective screen. And we'll look at the snapshots there. We'll look at January of 21 versus January of 22. And so we can see not only do we have the production data, the purchases data, we illustrate the inventory that the railroads are holding. Uh, and so again, that's another way we can kind of carve out uh, and get uh, a high degree of accuracy in terms of our data. But that ISR number is the inventory to sales ratio. And you can see that in 21, it was 0.85, and then January of 22 is 0.81. Uh, put that uh, in the back of your brain there, uh, and we'll revisit that here in a minute. So with the dashboards that I teased you about in the last slide, they're actually present on this slide. And so uh, different scenarios for different parts of the country uh, that give us direct line of sight into what's going on, what's the general pulse, if you will, of what's going on with the sawmill and tie buyer interaction in terms of what do your log piles look like, what do your markets look like, uh, what do ties specifically look like in terms of uh, your production outlook, uh, you know, their competitive uh, arrangement or, uh, excuse me, situation uh, compared to the other commodities. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And I, I would uh, venture a guess is that's why over half the people are in the room uh, because of what other hardwood commodities are doing right now compared to cross ties. Um, <clears throat> with that, uh, again, some uh, information to kind of illustration, excuse me, to kind of help you understand uh, where we're going uh, and where we are and what it would look like normally uh, if we weren't where we are. So uh, remember that ISR number I talked to you about in January of 2021 or 2022? What was that number? 0.81, and we can notice here, uh, even though some of us may be uh, having to squint, it's uh, in March of 22, it's 0.78. Uh, uh, that cake don't bake, so to speak. So uh, when it's going down, uh, we have uh, a general sense of nervousness about the marketplace because that gives us a direct indicator uh, that uh, purchases are outpacing production. Uh, so, uh, no bueno, as they say, uh, and uh, we've got further graphs or illustrations that'll show you uh, where that has now uh, led us to uh, looking into uh, not only a historical perspective uh, to give us uh, a grasp of the current, 
but also looking at a historical perspective uh, to perhaps give us an insight into what's going to develop. Uh, and so uh, some of my A-plus students that are in the room uh, can pick up on what happened in 2009. And so what we've got here in this illustration is green, red oak, four quarter 2A. Depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, red oak four quarter 2A or three-ish uh, is kind of the direct comparison to what a cross tie would be. Uh, again, we could talk about it over cocktails. You could pontificate to me how that's right or wrong. But that generally speaking, that's the, the, the benchmark, if you will, uh, when we talk about a 79 cross die. And so uh, nobody freak out. We're not talking about specific prices. These are all published prices. Please don't run away because you're seeing the word price on the screen. Uh, it's, it's all published. Uh, with this, uh, I alluded to uh, an occurrence that happened in 2009, 2010. Uh, does anybody vaguely remember what was going on in 2009, 2010? It's a dirty word that starts with R. And so uh, if we see how uh, the green bar and the dark color bar have generally tracked uh, in terms of peaks and valleys about the same. But in 2009, 2010, there was an inverse relationship. Uh, and I would say from an antitrust perspective, uh, it was a necessity of the railroads uh, without, without getting into an antitrust perspective, I have to be a diplomat now because I'm an association guy, I'm learning. Uh, we, we can't talk about uh, too much specifics, but the railroads were in a similar situation in inventories where the inventories were uh, low because, again, purchases outpaced production. Or you could say it the other way if you want to sound fancy, production underpaced purchases. Uh, same thing, uh, glass half empty, half full kind of perspective. And so uh, tie price actually increased while red oak lumber price decreased. And it was because inventories were that low. There may have been, from a speculation standpoint, a state of awareness with the railroads of how volatile the situation and how dire the situation actually is. And so there lies the premise for where we may be headed now. I'm not uh, a naysayer. I'm not a pessimistic kind of guy. Uh, I'd like to think that data drives a good bit of my decisions or if I've ate recently or not. Uh, but even with that, uh, we can tell that even though this data is a little bit dated in terms of the month of the year that we're operating in, uh, we can see a general trend emerging. Uh, and who's to say that may not continue? If you look at it from, a, from an app, perspective to a southern perspective, uh, you kind of see some of the same things. And I know some of you in the room are, are, are taking a double quick look at that. Uh, this is like March data, so it gets worse on the lumber side. But the tie side gets better. Uh, that ball boils down and kind of what's going on with the market. Uh, it's, it's been a, uh, a challenge to manufacture things, to produce things. We're all aware of that. We've all been to meetings and club uh, venues, et cetera. Uh, we've stood up and we've talked about that. Um, you know, in terms of uh, overall production, uh, they alluded to it kind of the opening address today. Uh, I, I grew up in a, a sawmill family. Um, sometimes we can be our own worst enemies when it comes to killing a market. Um, but and I said this to the Missouri Forest Products Association, within the next 12 to 18 months, the Thai market will be so strong that the industry cannot overproduce and kill the market. And I, I'll, I'll back that up with some data here, but also uh, I challenge Missouri Forest Products Association to prove me wrong. And so I'll, I'll challenge this group too, any of you that are manufacturing ties, uh, prove me wrong that you can't uh, outpace the market within the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, I got quiet and talked real slow, even slower than normal, because I'm from Mississippi and I talk slow anyway, uh, to try to put emphasis on that, is that we can't outpace the market within the next 12 to 18 months, the inventories are too low. Some of these uh, are contributing factors, there's about half a dozen more, but. Uh, there wasn't space on the page, so I couldn't put all those. 
Uh, with production, same thing for most industries, labor inconsistencies, part equipment supply chain issues, da 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 da, uh, and then trucking shortages and rates because of some of the aforementioned. And then when it comes to the commodity pressures that have taken away from uh, uh, better, good, better tie production, uh, you know, obviously record hardwood lumber pricing. Again, some of the graphics you see there are old on purpose because it doesn't look good today, so I didn't want to put the newer stuff in that looked bad. Uh, and then uh, with just the usage in terms of so solid hardwood flooring and pallets, you know, they used to say, my dad used to say, by the way, my dad, uh, half a dozen or so of you, my dad is Buddy Irby, uh, and I'd like to say that I'm the smarter, better looking one. Uh, for those that know my dad, uh, you can appreciate that. Uh, he'd appreciate a text too. Uh, anyway, with the with the data that you see here, they they used to say pilots were an indicator of the economy. Uh, I'd say that we're in a little bit of a blip in the radar when it comes to that. In terms of, uh, it's really unprecedented what the pandemic uh, kind of did for us there, uh, and then where we are with the current administration. And then, and I won't get political. Don't worry. Don't get nervous and run out of the room. Um, we, we'll just have to see the big, ugly, hard word uh, perhaps is on the horizon. Uh, but I'd say what the, the better thing about that is uh, the time market's going to be good for the next 12 to 18 months. Please prove me wrong. Uh, I show this information. I got it from the Hardwood Market Report, guys. They're a great partner, really are. Uh, not too hard to talk to, tough to look at, but they got really good data. And so... Uh, we've got a uh, great partnership going with them. We feed, uh, they, we feed them data, they feed us data, and then their graphics are cooler than mine, so I like to use a lot of theirs. So you'll see several of those, uh, uh, one a little bit more el elemental coming up. But uh, this is a pretty telling inf bit of information. So if you look back from 2014 to, uh, let's just capture the end of 21 there, uh, you see a lot of these uh, commodity segments have actually lost production uh, when it comes to, or consumption has gone down, excuse me, uh, by these major uh, commodities. And so uh, one would postulate that uh, what does that mean for not only the dichotomy of what we do domestically, uh, but also uh, where's the market shifts occurring? Uh, and I can't speak uh, eloquently to much more than cross ties, but you can see that, or I can't speak eloquently about anything really, but I can speak to cross ties when it comes to uh, where we were in 2014 versus uh, where we're tracking now. Uh, I will say that I do offer some information later in the program that shows uh, a, a potential stabilization of that. Uh, and I offer some insights into uh, what is feeding that, why that's occurring, and where I think it's occurring um, uh, a little bit later. And so uh, the only segments that aren't negative uh, you can point out uh, on there, but uh, as uh, a very telling bit of information, uh, ties are down 14% in that uh, respective period. Uh, but I, I can support that with uh, real information, uh, so don't think uh, that that number is it going to continue to trend? I, I do believe it's it's normalizing uh, for for the dry kiln guys in the room, uh, uh, equalizing. So uh, this is fun because it has colors, right? So we can all uh, uh, look at this and kind of see where the market segments are uh, with a, a blue bluish type color, kind of cold uh, versus to what's going strong. You can see there, uh, pilots and ties have been head to head. Uh, for quite some time. Uh, I don't necessarily know about what is going to come with pallets. There's very spotty markets when it comes to pallets where uh, it's feast or famine. Uh, the great and limiting thing about our business is that it's so relationship oriented. Uh, so be nice to people uh, is probably the message there. But otherwise, uh, with those different relationships, uh, there's a little bit of a give and take. Uh, and I think some of the spottiness that you see out there in the marketplace is somebody got their feelings hurt. Uh, and so we can kind of see the, based on that graph I showed you uh, a bit ago, we can kind of see where the industry's kind of going. And I, I hope I alluded to this, 
you can see the, the breakout between uh, the grade lumber side versus the industrial side. Uh, and so uh, this data would have been supported now for about a decade or a little less than a decade where we're seeing that shift. I remember uh, as a kid coming to NHLA uh, meetings, as, that, was, that was our family vacation and those that no dad can appreciate uh, that, you know, we got to ride in the company vehicle and the company paid for the hotels and the company paid for the meals and we got to stay at the swimming pool while he was at the meetings. But uh, talking about just how that's kind of breaking down in terms of grade lumber side versus uh, the industrial side. And so is that uh, something that supports our, our ideas uh, to how we may model uh, things in the future? Maybe so. Uh, and so I think uh, not only for uh, uh, many other variety of reasons, uh, it's important that uh, folks like Dylan and I uh, communicate regularly and our uh, associations uh, can find common ground. You know, the, the, the F word in the hardwood industry is not what you think, it's, it's actually fragmentation. And so uh, I'll do a little bit of a bandwagon thing uh, towards the end, but uh, the better we are at communicating and working together uh, in a unified sense uh, certainly can't hurt us. So. Uh, I'd leave it with that. Uh, this is another uh, illustration that uh, HMR did better graphs than I do. They're more savvy with Excel than I am. Uh, so I like their information better than mine. And so you can see that that snapshot in time is showing us uh, where the inventories are. Uh, sad face, sad, sad faces all over the screen there. Uh, when it comes to at that time, uh, you know, we're nearly 18% or over 18% down compared to the previous time frame in the railroad tie inventories. And so as it takes a cross tie, five, six, eight, ten 10 months, depending on what species it is to dry in an air seasoning uh, perspective, um, you know, that's, that's a long time. And so we have, have, as we track that with the railroads and the producers giving us their inventory data, that helps us correlate all the information that we're taking. Again, I, I kind of mentioned that three-legged stool uh, in the power of the RTA data. Uh, with that being fed into it, uh, that ISR number is, has dropped considerably just in uh, within the frames that I showed you earlier. And so uh, good news perspective there is uh, inventories are now even lower than what's presented on the screen, uh, but that gives rise to, again, the potential for the hardwood cross tie market to be strong for the next 12 to 18 months. I can't emphasize that uh, enough. I can't give it justice that it should. If you take anything seriously away from my presentation uh, and caution there, uh, is that uh, the one underlying thing is that the hardwood market for cross ties is gonna be strong. But I understand, I, I, I come from a, a grade sawmill uh, background, uh, we can't have one or two commodities so far in differential from one or the other. The, the delta is only, the delta can only be so much to be withstanding, correct? I mean, you can't, you can't change your log buying principles profoundly overnight. Uh, you can't change your sawing solutions significantly overnight, and, and I get that. Um, but uh, with that, I'm hopeful that uh, there is uh, some way to find harmony by diversifying your output in a meaningful and long-term type scenario. And so with the, the cross town market being what it is today with inventories so low and the potential for 12 to 18 months, the market be strong, that there is caution that I would hope that other commodities would come back in some meaningful way to help stabilize. Uh, and I'd, I'd challenge the sawyers in the group to think about your future sawing solutions when it comes to your diversified portfolio and what your output is. And so the data here supports how strong cross ties are. And we all know that as mills face a potential of 
their prowess being questioned right now in terms of what their certain markets are doing and then are we indeed going into recession market and so those things are factors to heavily consider let me help you consider cutting cross ties so from 1992 again uh, if I went back to 87 it wouldn't fit on the page but from 92 until what our models are telling us uh, we've got total purchases of cross ties we break that out from the class one perspective to the small market small market is, is just that it's the regional railroads it's the short lines uh, there's over there's almost 600 short line and regional railroads out there today if you own a mile of track you own a railroad and so uh, with the infrastructure bill the way it is and then the legislation that we help pass to keep those railroads running smoothly because a lot of instances their first mile last mile in terms of they support class ones and then uh, they go into ports etc large hubs uh, a lot of those are short line and regional railroads they have the ability especially coming into 2023 uh, to purchase more ties and so while I think that's a good thing and a direct feed into the overall cross tie demand uh, it won't be to the point where uh, it's so much that the class ones won't be fully served. I think there's, with the market the way it is, there is healthy potential uh, for both the class ones and the small markets. If there's any small market people in the room, uh, I don't mean to diminish uh, what they do in any way. It's just, as you can see with the data, how that supports the breakdown. Uh, obviously the class ones, more track miles, heavier, faster trains, uh, that takes more ties to run. And again, as we run personnel across those tracks, uh, the quality of the track, obviously safety is number one. And so we can see some low years in the 14s. We can see some high years in the, in the mid, almost the mid 20s. What we've been tracking in the 18 million ties. And I know some of you are thinking, Nate, why, why is that? You just said we need more inventory and why won't the market be stronger to overcome? It's a variety of reasons all coming into confluence at one time. And so uh, with the economic prowess of the mills in a recession market, obviously uh, people are very attuned to that situation. We're very attuned to the lumber situation. We're very attuned to uh, needed ties. There are tie performance and service life enhan enhancements that people are doing actively today uh, to help, again, I think, normalize the market and so as RTA obviously is a strong you know, proponent of uh, the hardwood industry uh, we say that we're a membership organization helping keep wood tie markets strong and sustainable again our data supports this uh, with the railroad tie demand it's rising it's been pent uh, again those inventories in the 12 millions if they operate on an 18 million tie a year basis Think about that differential between 18 and 12. Uh, a really smart guy told me one time when I first started for UP, he said, if you want to run a dry treating basis, which most cross ties today are air stacked and then treated dry, they're not technically dry, but dry enough to treat, they're at 40 or 50% moisture content. And I won't get too technical in any of this, but he said to run a dry basis treatment, since it takes six, eight, 10 months to dry a cross tie, you need to have 75 to 80% of your annual inventory in stock to maintain that flow of treating a dry base on a dry basis. Hope that made sense. And so with the railroads not in a position to be at 75 to 80% of the inventory, there will be some boltonizing wet treatment that has to occur. But again, that's giving power by order of magnitude to how strong the tie market is going to be. Uh, and so there are some alternatives. I get asked a lot about selling yellow pine, uh, and I try to tell folks that every, so to speak, uh, every type of tie has its place. When we talk about selling yellow pine, I encourage people to talk about it in terms of, say, dense, dense southern yellow pine. And so we're talking about six to eight rings per inch. Uh, there's a lot of pine being used in bridge timbers. There are some pine cross ties being cut. That's a, that's a slow mileage, lower tonnage corridor 
very specific type situation. So while there is a place from, for some southern yellow pine, uh, hardwood cross ties uh, are the predominant. And in terms of overall track construct, uh, ties, wood ties are still, uh, in some cases, 90 to as high as 95% of track infrastructure is still supported by wood. And so that's, which is a really great, fun, uh, environmentally friendly type thing to say, it's real. Uh, it's, it helps build America by all the people that contribute to getting those ties from tree to track. It tells a really compelling uh, and warm and fuzzy story. So with hardwood commodity swings, I'll leave with this, and this on, on the market segment, because we'll get into tie grading here in just a second. I got 15 minutes to wow you about that. But with the market segment, many people in this room have been burned by the overnight PO cut, where you had a standing order to cut cross ties. Overnight, you come in on your fax machine, your PO got zeroed out. And I, I hear that story a lot, still hear that story. I still hear about, well, you say the tie market's strong, it's gonna be strong, but I've lived and breathed it. I've had my trucks on the way to a facility loaded with ties and they got turned around. That's unfortunate. However, with the market the way it is today, and then furthermore, the purchasing ability and prowess of railroad tie purchasers today, and I'm talking specifically the railroads, not the tie buyers, but the railroads themselves, as scrutinized as they are in their portfolio, i.e. their book of business to be able to purchase, you gotta give them some sympathy because some of these railroad purchasers have been squeezed to the point where they don't just purchase cross ties and bridge timbers and switch ties. They purchase locomotives, they purchase ballast, they purchase rail. They cannot be a subject matter expert in any one thing. So it's our job, all of us, not just RTA, all of us in the room to help educate those purchasers that there is harmony to be found when it comes to purchasing hardwood cross ties on an annualized basis. And I'm not talking fiber contracts or anything like that. I'm just talking about good, honest, look a person in the eye, shake their hand, every day good, doing good business and being good partners and being good stewards of our industry. And so with railroads so scrutinized in what they buy, they need to buy a steady purchase of ties all throughout the year, not just in peak production seasons. If lumber wasn't doing what it was doing and still kind of high, uh, this would be the normal tie peak production season, August through November. But obviously the way the market is, we're, we've seen an influx of ties since about June 15th coming in through the pipeline. And that's because other commodities are allowing that. Railroad purchasers want to have discussions with tie buyers and sawmills, whoever's supporting that pipeline. And again, I'm not trying to, to, to you know, conflict in any way, but the railroad's purchasers being so scrutinized in what they purchase, how they purchase, how much they purchase, they would welcome conversations about steady flow of material on a year-round basis. That means everybody along the supply line can support and know and be able to operate by being able to plan better. And so uh, as a former tie purchaser for a railroad, I had a very, uh, I was, I was, I had a very gracious footprint in this line of work, I had very loyal sawmillers that I bought directly from. I also used the treaters. We would go to sawmills together. The thing about a sawmill visit, they either love you or hate you, and you gotta sit there and take it on the chin no matter what. But the fact that a railroad person would come by and either listen and take it, or give them great news about how good the tie market was meant something, and so, we're losing that relationship 
And again, there's, there's tie buyers out there that would love for railroads to come with them on a sawmill trip. I know sawmills would love to see railroad people. We are an advocate of maintaining that decorum because it's helpful. It helps the sawmills and all their supporting industries understand their book of business. And so that's what RTA is. RTA is a community of just that and more. And so as we get together October 2nd through the 5th at the Wyndham Grand Bonnet Creek in Orlando, Florida, we can talk about that uh, in much more detail. The, the time market being strong for the next 12 to 18 months is just one thing. Having a steady demand for a product to the tune of about 18 to 19 million ties a year for the foreseeable is real. And so there's opportunity there. Man, I sold that hard. All right, so with uh, RTA in terms of tie grading, we actually offer a tie grading seminar. And so this is our annual event. I know it's past August 9th through 11th, but I don't want to change the slide. So this shows what we just did in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I had to have a translator up there, by the way. That's way too north for this southern boy to go up there and talk eloquently. And so uh, with that, we've got uh, not only a two and a half day immersive tie grading, anything from species to defects to railroad engineering, uh, to how ties are processed and treated, it's all inclusive. We have tie graders, we have tie buyers, we have uh, sawyers, we have corporate people, we have salespeople, administrative people. It is a one-stop shop to learn about the tie industry from a technical perspective. I've helped teach that, teach that for uh, five or six years now, even before I went to work for the RTA. We also have a tie grading app. Uh, this is actually uh, in partnership uh, with the Western Wood Preservers Institute. Uh, they help maintain this platform for us. We also have booklets, so if anybody wants me to mail them some booklets, I think they're $4,000 a piece. I'd cut you a deal at two seventy-five dollars a piece, but uh, I, seriously, I have these booklets available. I want them out of my life, really. So if you'll take some booklets, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so as we get into basic tie designations, I'll talk about some of the the general principles. And so the basic dimensions or de designation, excuse me, uh, you hear a lot about grade tie. Uh, you hear a lot about grade fives. You also hear fours and threes and twos and things like that. Let's just keep it simple. A grade tie is a mainline tie. Uh, an industrial grade is just that, sidings, yards, etc. cetera. Uh, then an outright call uh, is not good for railroad purposes, but can be repurposed for other uh, instances. So we're talking about seven by nine. Uh, in terms of face versus side. Uh, your general mainline tie is an eight foot, six inch tie. And I know some of you are sitting there burning in your seats about this. So about uh, five, eight years ago now, the railroads uh, that are now run by uh, accountants and financers, and I'm not dogging financers and counters, they're just not railroads, accountants, they're just not railroaders, uh, had the bright idea to change from a nine foot standard tie to an eight foot, six standard tie because they'd save money. Whew. Uh, with that, uh, we can talk a little bit about not only uh, the dimensions, seven by nine, about eight, six, but again, this is setting the platform for some of the grade considerations I'll talk to you about in a minute. And so uh, for my A-plus students, uh, you can see on one side of the screen, we have a perfectly good red oak box heart tie. Uh, we have a split hickory tie. This came out of Tennessee. I looked at it too long and it shook too, so it's got real bad shake in it. Don't stare at your ties too long. They shake on you, especially if they're sycamore. Uh, and then we got another oak tie that uh, is a true split heart. I said that backwards, so the one in the middle is kind of a quarter heart. The heart is more towards the corner. That's where you have a big enough log where you can take four ties out of the center. And so this illustration kind of shows uh, when I worked for Union Pacific, I created this because uh, I wanted to look smart and fancy. I created this Forest Products Best, Best Practices series uh, because not only did my own uh, team members within UP need to be educated about what a good wood tie looks like and what our specs actually say. That's a tough conversation when you've got uh, corporate brass yelling at you about something that still meets spec. And so this was a nice polite way for me to say this is what our spec is and here's pictures and colors to help uh, you understand that. Uh, with a box tart tie, obviously a log big enough uh, to render that where uh, you just produce a few jacket boards off to the side. Uh, that tie with the heart being encapsulated, meaning the heart is in the very middle of the tie, you don't have those adverse drying uh, scenarios where anytime, as you know, the heartwood gets towards the outside of a tie, 
you start having uh, disequilibrium between the heartwood and sapwood region. And if heartwood gets closer to the exposed air, you're going to have check splits, uh, shake, other things to kind of uh, uh, exacerbate themselves because of that. And so a box tart tie is an ideal tie. I will say that railroads now uh, are taking more split heart ties uh, than if markets were in another swing. I don't know if that's going to go away or not. Uh, it was something that with the proper training with railroad personnel, they would know how to flip that tie and orient the sap side up because that's the key is even if it's a split heart tie, we need, still need the sapwood side up. Am I speaking German? Because I got some weird looks going on right now. Uh, so with wood being the, the, the center part, obviously being the heartwood, and then towards the outer edge is the sapwood. That's what I'm referring to. Uh, I'll stop talking about that. Uh, so rail bearing area, this is the most critical focal point of ties, and so this is actually where the, the, the wheels of the locomotive roll over. And so a whole host of quality conformance uh, needs to occur in this rail bearing area. So if you hear people uh, talk about uh, rail bearing area, now you know uh, and you can tell them uh, that's RBA and it's uh, a really important focal point. This is down in uh, South Texas, uh, this picture of ties just placed outside on track. It's Victoria, Texas. I walked nine miles that day uh, looking at ties, uh, and it was a really good uh, practice, not only for me to educate uh, my folks about wood tie spec, but for them to educate me uh, about what happens on the railroad. <clears throat> ARIMA is our go-to, so ARIMA Chapter 30 is the go-to when it comes to general tie specs. The caution there is uh, each railroad has a small deviation from that. So each railroad is particular, their own entity, they want what they want. They may not know what they want specifically or why they want, excuse me, specifically, but each, each railroad has a little bit different spec and I talk about this in the ARIMA 30 to kind of give us con, context there. Uh, these are just some of the standards uh, and then some of the measurements for the allowable defects. You can see a list there. Uh, I've got a booth here at the meeting, it's uh, booth 637. Uh, be glad to talk to you about tie defects uh, uh, more in depth uh, if you'd like. I'd prefer to do that over a cocktail though, uh, so just let me know. When it comes to uh, Wayne, obviously that's the lack of wood or the presence uh, or the outer uh, presence of the tree. Uh, here's some of the parameters there. Uh, one slide or one thing that I don't show that's uh, really fundamental to a lot of the folks in this room is the species matrix. And so uh, when it comes to species preferences for cross ties, it's predominantly going to be oak and hickory uh, and then mixed hardwoods. And so that can vary between 70 to 75 to 80 percent oak hickory mix versus uh, the remainder in a mixed hardwood. Some of the oldest ties that I see on track are actually sweet and black gum. And they do not have the hardness profile or the density profile of an oak or hickory. But with that fallback of the species matrix is going to be 70 to 80 percent oak hickory versus 25 to 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent mixed hardwoods, that, the reason that sweet gum and that black gum laid in track and survived that long is because it had three iterations of oak and hickory on both sides of it that, that have since been replaced three times, like I said. And so... Uh, it treats better, uh, and it's usually got uh, a harder tie next to it uh, to help save some of that load uh, that it absorbs. Uh, in terms of decay, obviously no decay is allowed for grade ties. Uh, blue stain is okay. That's a little open to interpretation there, uh, depending on what state uh, you have some of that discoloration. Um, holes are, are a tricky thing when it's not just one defined hole or one defined knot. So when you have carpenter uh, be, uh, uh, infestation and infestation, uh, it's hard to know how extensive those galleries are under the surface. Uh, there's me sticking my tape measure in a hole at a, a hole in a tie in Hope, Arkansas. Uh, there's just some illustrations of stuff that made it into the stacks that probably shouldn't have. In this particular instance, we're talking about knots. Um, a knot can vary, again, inside and outside of the rail bearing area, as can all those other defects that we listed. Uh, the greatest and worst thing about sycamore is that it'll shake on you. Uh, most tie buyers will tell you what their 
species they're able to take. And so sometimes sycamore is included, sometimes it's not. Sometimes hackberry is included, sometimes it's not. Yellow poplar and cottonwood are in the same boat. It's again from a hardness density profile perspective. Uh, shake in terms of measuring, uh, you're looking at the third of the tie and within uh, an inch of the tie. You can't take that shake because you don't know how it's going to develop through treating and then as a heavy train gets rolling across it. Splits, the difference there between that and checks is splits go from face to face, whereas checks stay within a contained face. Uh, this is a split heart tie where it's checked all the way down. That tie would be fine if they install it correctly, meaning they put that check side, heart side down uh, in track so you don't have water get into the check uh, and rot the tie from the inside out. Bark seam obviously can be a bit of an issue just because of the forces. There's a lot of dynamics at play when it comes to not only putting a tie into track, but that big heavy train going across it. Uh, bow and other manufacturing and twist, excuse me, other drying uh, defects, uh, all aid into how they t those ties perform on track. And so we try to say, obviously, we want to maintain as high quality as we can throughout the process. And so at treating plants, part of my due diligence when I worked for UP was I would take ties out of circulation at various points throughout the transformation because we don't want junk out on track, right? We, our first priority is safety. And anytime anybody questions me about quality of ties and what I would take or what not take, pause. We have our own personnel operating on track. We have Amtrak operating on our track. And, we, and at UP, we ran through 6,000 different communities. Our obligation, first and foremost, was safety. Ah, oh, see how dramatic I got there with that. Uh, so in terms of knots and holes, again, these contribute to failure out on track, premature failure out on track. That's why we have designations that let us know how much we can and can't take. And so with that, I'll stop. We are the Railway Tie Association. It's not my association. It's our association. Uh, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something constructed out of it. I think I did too. And so thank you for that. Nate was very smart. He didn't provide any time for questions, but if you, any of you want to ask him where the convention is or when, we'll, we'll get that. So I do think we have a minute if somebody has any pressing questions to ask. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious. What, uh, it, he, you're, you're not allowed to ask questions. Go ahead. So uh, if you go to rta.org, you can see the full spectrum. Uh, an associate membership is our most reasonable uh, membership. That's just $75. And then when it comes to a sawmill, like a producer direct type member, uh, it's as high as $425, $450. Uh, that gets you uh, discount type pricing for all of our events. Uh, it gets you, again, not only all the data, access to all the data and all the models and all the dashboards, uh, but it it should make you feel better inside that you're being part of the community uh, by contributing to such a distinguished and historic uh, group uh, as the RTA. We've got, um, again, almost 3,000 members that believe in what we, we do. They can give a far de better testament than what I can, uh, and there's several in the room. And uh, please, if you don't mind, uh, we'd appreciate uh, you reaching out to them or reach out to me, and I can, I can connect the dots. Thank you for that, Terry. Both. Got one more question? The, the railroad inventories are too low. Of course, I can't speak to what they're going to do. Uh, they, they've been very gracious in terms of supporting the sawmill industry. I gave the 2009, 2010. Uh, illustration. Uh, railroads are very much aware of the status of the industry right now, uh, and I can't say anything more than that from an antitrust perspective, but they're very much aware and they're very much supportive of our industry. And so I would invite you uh, to your tie buyers that service your particular mill, ask them about uh, if, uh, tell them to, that if you're willing, 
uh, you'd invite railroaders directly to your facility because it is uh, empowering for both sides, of the, all sides of the spectrum. That's correct, and so with yeah. So with that, I can't speak to what they'll do, but they're aware mills would close, and then that would that would that would devastate the supply chain. But they can't keep prices just to keep the supply chain up. I'm not saying that. Please, I did not say that in any way. Yes, sir. I, when I was at UP, I can speak to that as a direct example, uh, we did quarterly pricing. And so anytime we would uh, change pricing, uh, and this was a bit before Tony's time, but uh, his predecessor would tell you, uh, uh, since I may be a little biased and I'm talking, it, it, I'm not bragging here, but we, we would give 30 days notice because that wasn't enough, but that's what we could do. Uh, we didn't want to pull legs out from anybody, under anybody. Uh, we know that uh, railroads are aware of log buying occurs 365, uh, and sometimes logs are bought uh, based on certain commodities status, uh, and there's a high risk there. And so uh, most railroads uh, try to operate on a, a, a beyond a, a small window, not a week to week. Um, but uh, there's, there's a lot of culture out there uh, that's supporting a longer term, steadier book of business type relationship. And so uh, I think that's actually growing uh, some momentum. And so uh, that would be a really great talking point uh, between mills and their tie buying entity and their tie buying entity uh, back to the railroads because as Terry said, this is a, this is a partnership uh, and the very, railroads are very aware of that. Yes. We'll have blips on the radar, but the reason that uh, is normalizing to 18 is the introduction of a dual treatment scenario of cross ties. And so some of you are aware of uh, initial treatment of green ties into a borate solution. It's actually called DOT, it's dioctoborate tetrahydrate. Let's all say that together, dioctoborate tetrahydrate. Uh, and so that was implemented heavily uh, in 2012, 2013. That's now showing itself where ties are actually in some instances lasting longer. But again, it balances itself out, right? Because we've got a higher standard of track uh, than what we've kept before, again, because of the human element and the safety precedence. And so as our models are showing 18, 18, 18 for the next several years, uh, it's all feeding into the situation. But the reason it's, it's, it was that much and then uh, it's kind of normalizing is because we're starting to see ties last a little bit longer. Please don't run away and say ties are going to last forever. We got to no. That's it's all going to work itself out. It's, it's all coming in kind of a coalesced type situation. But that's that's why. Yeah. There's a couple of different uh, things kind of on the horizon about that. It's a little bit of a sticky subject. Uh, no pun intended, uh, Chris. That's sticky. Uh, so uh, with with ties. Um, Probably 15 years ago, people used to pay the railroads to come get their old ties. 
And so uh, while the EPA lets us put ties in track for an industrial setting type application, uh, those ties are, are, are not deemed for any other situation. And so uh, the railroads have to, to sever the chain of custody at the point they take ties out of track. And then there are entities that come in and pick the ties up. They now retain the ownership and life of that tie uh, and they disposition ties in different ways. And so some ties are taken to landfills, some ties are incinerated, uh, and then some ties are repurposed for different applications. Sometimes they're repurposed and then sold back to the railroads. So uh, that's really like Tito's and water type conversation there. That I can't talk too much about that. Last question, sure. Uh, just curious, you say so you're the main planner with the 18 million ties a year. Yes, sir. What, I'm curious, I know there's other ties other than the fuel product. How much, how big a market is that that could possibly or could be filled with hardwood cross ties versus pine branches? Because I mean, those are famous as the worst, but right. how many more are out there? So, for instance, uh, probably eight years ago, uh, concrete ties uh, were the new trendy fad thing among new railroaders. And some railroaders put their hat on a cro concrete cross tie as that tie was literally being beaten by the rail, be beaten by the trains and pounded into dust. Uh, those people no longer work in the railroad industry. But uh, every wheel, because of gravity, and I won't get any more technical than that, has a flat spot on it. And so the great characteristic of wood is that it can return uh, to its degree of proportionality. It flexes. And so uh, that's the savior of a wood tie. It's not only it's renewable, sustainable, uh, but it's also a better suited product for that application. I will say this, there are some concrete ties being used. Anytime you have uh, a, 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 an approach where you've got hard banking curves or an ascent or a descent, uh, concrete ties are used. So a typical class one's purchasing paradigm would be 90% uh, wood ties, uh, uh, a small percentage of uh, concrete ties, uh, an even smaller percentage of steel ties, and then the next emerging thing on the market is a wood plastic composite tie that actually works. And so I was on track with CN last week uh, looking at a batch of composite ties because they knew what I dealt with when I worked at Union Pacific. We went through three iterations of terrible wood plastic composite ties. They would either break upon installation because they can't take the force of being pushed into the track and they just pop. Or when you actually, if you actually get them under track without failing, when you go to take uh, a drill to drill the spike holes, if you get too close to the exterior of the tie, it creates a fissure and the next time the heavy train rolls across it, it breaks the tie up under uh, the rail plate where the spikes went in, and then it looks like dog ears when you look at on track, the outsides of the ties are flipped up. Uh, and so there is a new blend uh, that's got promise. It's called EverTrack out of St. Louis. I've been to their facility. Uh, they take uh, a wood and, uh, oh, excuse me, a, a plastic and rubber composite aggregate, blend it and mold it one by one in a cast type system uh, at like 700 degrees. Uh, and then they not only x-ray it, but they also mechanically test it. And then they have a destructive sampling that they do as well. That's got promise. It's terribly expensive. And again, it falls under the same potential risk of being broken while putting being installed or, or potentially uh, deteriorated in some way because of the spike drilling. I'm losing my voice. Is your elaboration of saying maybe we can grow that 90% market share that we own, could we grow that to 50% or so? Yeah. Right. But you, but you could also lose some too. So from a realistic standpoint, uh, wood is still a preferred material for a variety of reasons. And then the more we can, the more Tony can 
work with his top buyers and in turn liaise with the railroads directly and unite all of these cogs, the better off we'll be. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. You probably realize he's a wealth of information, so he does have a booth down there. I received a phone call to tell me to tell you lunch is down there in the exhibit hall right now, so you can go down there for the exhibit hall. Have a chance to see Nate in the exhibit hall. He'll give you more information. And uh, download his app in your app store, Google or Android, Thai Grading Guide. It's there. Thank you.